So, I have something to admit. I am a serial innovator. I can't help myself. I love change. I hate rules, except my own. And I, and I love going over barriers and giving people access. So I'm not a conventional Hollywood producer. I've only made one big studio movie. I do not live in a mansion. I do not have a fancy car. However, I've made movies that are about something, and I've given people opportunities that other people haven't. Now, Along that road, not only do I produce movies, but I also write movies. In fact, right now I'm writing a movie this moment in my house in LA, because I told the producer he'll have it in two weeks. So don't tell him I'm here. <laughs> and something odd happened. And this is a story of the odd thing that happened, which is through one innovation, I started another innovation. And I now run something called the Hollywood Way. And what the Hollywood Way does is it teaches corporate executives how to do their presentations connecting to their audiences through the use of story rather than boring them to death with PowerPoint. Now, we've just seen a bunch of PowerPoints <laughs> that actually work. I mean, I was blown away by Jacobs, because it's all pictures. And that's fine. Pictures are great. That's what a PowerPoint was meant to be, because we learn through sensory input. We don't learn when they put 400,000 words behind your head. And as a filmmaker, I'm always like really curious, what am I supposed to be looking at? Am I supposed to be reading those words, or am I supposed to be paying attention to the speaker? Or does the speaker think the audience are idiots because they turn around and they read the words out loud to the audience? Well, in Hollywood, what we do is we tell our stories through pictures. So in 1985, it was a time when if you were a young kid coming out of film school with a half hour movie under your arm, studios would throw you 10 or 20 million dollars to make a movie. No problem. Now, a few of these movies did really well. Most of them crashed and burned. Well, what happened was it left a whole lot of pissed off writers. If somebody was going to screw up their movie, it might as well be them. So they decided, we're not going to give people our movies to direct. We're going to direct them. However, studios didn't quite see it that way. They didn't know these writers could direct. I mean, at least these kids had half hour films. So my partner and I came up with an idea. We're going to make half hour movies for experienced industry professionals. We're going to give grown ups a way to compete with kids. And we sat down in a restaurant and we figured out, oh my gosh, we would probably have to pay for insurance and we probably have to pay for food, but we'll get crew and actors to throw in for free because then we'll owe them favors and the directors are owe them favors and we'll blackmail Kodak into giving us films and Panavision, maybe they'll give us cameras and we'll, we'll probably need $30,000 of film. Now I can tell you in retrospect, we could have thrown a dart at $30,000. It was so not the number. But we went to a guy named David Putnam, who had just rode into Hollywood on this white horse called Change. And David was going to get rid of fat producer deals. And he was going to get rid of bloated $100 movies. And he was going to make small, meaningful movies about something. And we told him our idea. And he leapt out of the chair. And he ordered um, six films a year for two years. And we decided we needed to do this as a competition. So we ran a one-line ad in both trade papers and got 635 applications for our first year. And we picked the six. And this is a cut-together clip of our first film, which won our first Oscar. You're not going to find a job, the right job, at an ordinary job interview. <laughs> This is where everybody is. No wonder no one's around lunchtime. They're all here. The owner, Ray Pendali, came over and introduced himself to me. He told me his place was the latest trendy lunchtime ballroom where guys like myself, obviously successful, dance to the old tunes all the time talking business. The powerful usually dance in their own spotlight. So be careful. I'm what they call dead meat in this town. And most guys who are seen dancing with me more than often, I thought less of. Actually, I am looking for a good job. 
Oh. Well, then I'll do you a favor and, and say goodbye. was we needed to find 30 guys who could dance with each other <laughs> for free. <laughs> so we held auditions. And you have never seen anything funnier than a whole bunch of straight guys trying to figure out who would lead <laughs> and how you could dance with each other and still say far enough away. You're not going to touch. So we know we need rehearsals, right? So we get Warner Brothers to give us a free rehearsal space. Well, the problem is the Directors Guild goes on strike 7 a.m. the morning of our rehearsal. What are we going to do? We have an intrepid PA, production assistant, who calls his temple his Orthodox Jewish temple, and says, we need a place to rehearse dancing. OK, all you have to do is not bring kosher food in, uh, unkosher food. We're dancing away. The guys are actually, as you saw, getting closer and closer to each other. When I get summoned to the balcony of the temple, where the concentration camp survivor, 75-year-old facility supervisor, is spitting anger. This is a temple. How could you do this? And all I could say to him is, we didn't bring in non-kosher food. <laughs> well, finally, I talked him into letting us stay. And he said, I'm just going to watch you. And if anything non-kosher happens here, well, thank God it didn't. And Ray's got nominated for an Oscar. Now, our friend David got fired because Hollywood wasn't open to change. <laughs> and a new woman had come in to run Columbia Studios. And the day we were nominated for our Oscar, she canceled lunch with us. This was not a good sign. Two, year, two days later, our entire program was canceled. Now, by then, we had turned nine people who were writers into motion picture directors. They had movies. Every agent in Hollywood loved us, because when their writers whined about wanting to direct, they just sent them our way. So we went to Don, and they said, you have a million dollars in foreign sales contracts. Give it to those guys. Let them use it to run their program. And she said, fine. Now, we only needed $600,000. And remember, we had a commitment for a second year. This was for the third year. And we started going to banks. We went to the first bank. Too much money. Second bank, too little money. We don't loan to Hollywood. Foreign money. Who, we went everywhere in New York and LA. Nobody would loan to us. Well, what we did is we finally found a bank in Utah. <laughs> Not a problem. We'll be happy to give you your 600000 Oh, but please, could you just sign your houses as guarantees, extra collateral? Well, we were young and dumb. We didn't know any better. We signed our houses. Now, what we didn't know about foreign sales contracts is they never pay. So comes about October, and we call up the banks. We've been asking our foreign sales guy, where's the money? Where's the money? Where's the money? It's coming. It's coming. And we said to the bank, the money's coming. The money's coming. And they said, we'll take your house. So we went to all the agents who had thought it was a great idea for us to sign over our houses. And they said, oh, you really want us to bail you out? Then we went to the directors who said, thank you very much, but we can't help you. Well, luckily. Showtime had a new innovative guy. And we went to this guy, and he picked up our series. And he ordered another year. And we won the Oscar, and everything was great. He gets fired. <laughs> <laughs> We're now in our fourth year. And the new guy comes in, calls us up. And what is the first thing he do? He cancels us. So what happens? We're very sad. We get nominated for another Oscar. And he calls up, and he says, did I say canceled? <laughs> This went on for year after year after year, till finally we weren't nominated anymore, and we were canceled. <laughs> so then an agent says to me, movie stars. And we go to Showtime, and we say, movie stars. And so we say, canceled? We're going to triple your budgets. And we're going to let um, you do 12 with movie stars, which we did. 
And the first year we got nominated for four out of the five Oscars. And that went on for a while, and we ultimately won three Oscars through all of this. We also ended up starting 60 people's careers as directors who wouldn't have gotten the opportunity otherwise. But ultimately, we weren't nominated for an Oscar, and right away we were canceled and we were done and it was over. However, not only had we started people's careers, we had broken barriers for people of color, we had broken barriers for women, and more importantly, we'd broken barriers for young crew people because we let women shoot movies, which you never ever see. We had tons of women cinematographers. We moved up our poor PAs who worked for free being production designers. A couple of people who won Oscars were production designers first for us. We gave people chances to do what they really, really wanted to do. And we had no money, so we had to do the impossible all the time. And I had hundreds of people come and work for us. So one day, my phone rings, and it's one of those people. And now she's a big executive in a corporation. She says, are you still teaching those pitching classes you used to teach? Now, I'm an independent producer and writer with three kids, and I'm a single mom. Anything that even smells like money, I just go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, sure, why? And she said, well, we've been noticing that our storytelling doesn't work. We use PowerPoints. Now, this is the honest to God truth. This was four years ago. I had never seen a PowerPoint. I did not know what a PowerPoint was. I said, oh, that sounds horrible. I mean, I'll come in and I'll figure it out. She said, great, HR will call you. I sort of knew what HR was. <laughs> so I went out and I read every book I could get my hand on about organizational storytelling. And I thought, OK, I'm fine. It's the same rules. You know, make people like you, talk with passion, paint pictures with words. It's what I've been doing my whole life. I also learned what PowerPoints were. Words. PowerPoints were words. I did a little bit of reading. I knew they were supposed to be images, but they were words. And I made up this whole class, which we now call the Hollywood Way. And it's a very, very simple thing. Because as a motion picture producer, you do three things. You do business day in and day out. You do contracts. You negotiate deals. You do everything everybody does in normal business. So I know how to talk business. Also, I went to law school. Um, you also manage ego, day in, day out, day in, day out. You try saying no to Richard Dreyfuss or Helen Mirren or Vanessa Redgrave, and you'll see what it's like to manage an ego. Um, and the third thing you do is you tell stories. So what I do in my classes is I teach people a couple simple things. One thing I teach them is it's all about them. Nothing you have to say in a sales kind of situation is that much different than your competitors, right? How do you get the sale? They like you. They want to work with you. Sometimes your presentation is marginally not as good as your competitors. But if they like you, because work is going to be dinner and lunch and on the phone, they're going to pick you and make your presentation better. So I teach people that the most important thing is to be yourself. Because people somehow think that when you go through the door in the office, you're business. Well, I show up in my Tweety Bird tennis shoes and black jeans, and I tell everybody to relax and be themselves. Talk to people when you're doing presentations like you would talk to your wife or your kids or your family. Now, how do we talk to them? We talk to them in story. So if people like you and you have passion for your subject because you're interested, you've got to be interested in what you're telling people. If you're not interested in what you're talking about, how can you get anybody else interested? I have actually made people pitch me paper clips. Somebody will say to me, I'm boring. I say, think of the most boring thing on the planet Earth and pitch it to me. And they make me laugh because I give them permission to be interesting. So I teach people how to be interesting by just caring about what they're talking about. The next thing I teach people is they've got to paint pictures with words. Yesterday, Glenn talked about a battery the size of a toaster. Glenn could have put up a PowerPoint chart with dimensions of batteries, and he could have talked about inches, but he talked about a battery that was the size of a toaster. And I saw his battery. I got it. 
So that's what I teach them, that words can be pictures, that you can connect with people, because people don't make decisions in their heads. You make decisions in your gut. You can't remember the facts, but you can remember the emotions. So if you can just learn to talk to people, like you tell a movie where you make people feel, you make people see things and remember, a good story is memorable, because you have to remember it to tell somebody, repeatable, because you never, ever are telling the story to the yes. So they have to be able to take your story and repeat it up the ladder and actionable. Get them to do what you want, even if it's remember the story. And if you can get people to learn how to tell stories this way as human beings to other human beings, they're going to succeed. Whereas a PowerPoint, which has put them to sleep and disconnected them and made you sort of mutter and taken away your passion, is going to defeat you. So my filmmaking career, which still goes on, witness the script, has sort of moved into this thing where I go in and I work with executives and my only goal is to get them to pull down the barriers between themselves and the people they're talking to. And that's what I do.